On the island of Newfoundland Upon the Selwyn's coast Lies the little town of Virgil To whom all things this told There are so many islands That lie just off her shores And when the cold north wind blows You can hear the billows roar The people from the village Make their living from the sea They like their independence it shows that they are free Some fish in their small boats In the wind, the rain and sleep While others make their living on the offshore Call their fleet If known to share a tragedy Down When the memories overcome, they show their grief with tears. For they have lost some loved ones to the furies of the sea. For heartaches and heartbreaks are locked in. Got beauty carved on its rugged shore. Seven miles of pure white sand. Who could ask for more? The mountains and the valleys where the rivers run so fast, and the salmon rise to the sportsman's fly as he makes. Another cast. Tell the people of this village, love their native home. For anyone who goes away, oh, surely will return. It's like that life. Rugged bellies burn so deeply in your soul. What makes this rugged bellies burn so deeply in your soul? Good evening, and welcome to this week in review. Tonight in our stories, we have Windstorm, Dinner Theater. Quiz for Quasi, Norwalk Virus, Town Council Report. Please stay tuned for these stories after this. When you wish. When you wish for something wonderful to happen. Sometimes it can make you forget. About the needles. And the pain. And get through this thing. Forget about being stuck inside. Laugh with my family? Go somewhere really amazing and get through this thing. The Children's Wish Foundation of Canada. Imagine the difference a wish can make. On Wednesday, Virgil was hit with a wind and freezing rainstorm. Winds gusts were over 100 kilometers per hour. I took my camera to have a look. I did not notice any damage, but did take the effects on the water.
On April the 8th, the Anglican Church women will be hosting a dinner theater. Brenda Strickland, who did not want to appear on camera, did give me some information on the event. She said that the evening will begin at 7 p.m. It consists of a roast beef dinner and dessert, during which there will be music and singing. Following the dinner will be comedy skits and more music. Reverend George Charles will be the MC for the evening. There is a cast of 10 members participating in the event. They are planning to do a repeat performance of the skits sometime in July. The funds raised from this will benefit Church Shingle Project. They had a great response with all tickets being sold. They wish to thank everyone for their support and look forward to serving a nice meal with great entertainment. On Thursday night, the Drama Club of Virgil Academy put up their play called The Quest for Quasi. This is the same play they will be using at the Drama Festival this weekend. We wish them all the best in their performance. Here is a clip from that play. Welcome to the dating game. Today our lovely bachelorette is none other than the little charmer in a scarlet who enjoys picnic basket launches, taking long walks in the woods, and skipping. Would you welcome Red Rodding Woods? How do you do, love? I hear you have a thing for wolves. Grr. Uh, <laughs> bachelor number two, say hello to Miss Riding Hood. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the name. Uh, mm -hmm. hi, my name's Lord Red Riding Hood. Well, actually, my real name is... Yes, it's all very interesting, but moving on here. Last but not least, bachelor number three. How will you welcome our cuddly little bachelor in three? Pleased to meet your acquaintance, Miss Riding Hood. Thanks, it's nice to meet you. Now, let's get on with the question. Red, what is your first question, and to whom will it be directed? I'd like to ask Batch number one, where would you take me on the first date? Hey, about a nice little restaurant where they serve pork chops. Groovy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Batch number two, hey, would you ask me on the first date? I'd say, baby, this is your lucky day. You get a chance to go to what? Fat <laughs> <laughs> okay. we suggest we spend a rainy day together. Well, I think a bell tower would be nice. Of course, I'll let you choose. Whatever makes you happy. Very well said, number three. And now, Miss Rodenwood, next question. Yes, I'd like to ask Fat one to make a poem telling me about himself. You are the little lady, number one. Hmm. Let's see. Okay, here it goes. Roses are red, two piggies are dead. I like to eat bacon. For you, this poem I'm making. Can you write in batch number two the same question? I am so handsome and charming too. I love to look at myself in the mirror, and all the girls go crazy about me. <laughs> That's a poem, it doesn't even rhyme. Well, it's free verse, besides it's so true. <laughs> Whatever. Batch number three, why don't you have a go at it? Uh, I wish that you choose me as your man. I really try to please you the best I can. I like to get to know you well. I even like you better than my bill. <laughs> That's beautiful. It was even in an Amex Hummer, just like Shakespeare. Thanks, he's my favorite poet. Not to rush you, Rick, but we need to wrap this up. So there are 62 sponsors to air their commercial. On it, have you made a decision? Can you give our bachelorette any advice? Bachelor number one. <laughs> Bachelor number two.
brother Miss Shakespeare deserves a chance. Okay, don't say I've been warning. And now let's meet the bachelor you did not choose. Straight to us trying to puff and puff a birthday stand. Would you welcome the big bed book? Listen, baby, you're looking for a good time later. <laughs> Next, the Prince of Boys and Charming, the ultimate and cool Prince Charming. You're lost, Chucka. What do you see what's coming next? Please, Mr. Chucka. And last, but not least, here from the Bell Tower of Notre Dame, not other than the hottest hunchback around, Quasimodo. On track. Please be advised that there has been cases of Norwalk virus present in this community. Norwalk is a virus that causes a mild to moderate gastrointestinal illness. Norwalk is spread very quickly from person to person by the facial oral route. Symptoms include sudden onset of nausea, vomiting, non-bloody diarrhea, abdominal cramps, headache, and sometimes a low-grade fever. Symptoms usually do not last more than two or three days and do not require treatment unless there is severe dehydration. The most important means of preventing Norwalk transmission and infection is exercising frequent and appropriate hand washing. Washing hands before and after contact with symptomatic persons. Wash hands before entering and after exiting the hospital. Do not visit patients in hospital if you have symptoms of Norwalk. If you are suffering from symptoms of Norwalk, try to contain yourself to one area and one bathroom if possible. Continue to drink fluids when possible. Limit contact with other people and use beach blades cleaners. If symptoms persist, please contact your physician or call the Elf Line at 1-888-709-2929. Mayor Jerome McDonald came by the studio with his town council report. Good evening. Your town council report for March the 24th, the council held his meeting. The meeting was scheduled for uh, uh, last week, but uh, due to other commitments, some councilors couldn't make it, so we went ahead this week on March the 24th. First of all, I want to talk about is our water system. And for some time now, I've been coming here and giving reports on the water system. And it's very difficult to do because there's no way that uh, we can give a accurate, accurate report because things change so fast. It uh, reminds me of the northeast wind. When it blows, it blows in every direction. But uh, it's very difficult to give an accurate report if uh, I also, I wait here on, come down here on a Friday evening after 3 o'clock, so I get the updated situation on it and uh, find out that um, the report is aired on Sunday night and Monday morning things have changed again. So I just can give you what I know on a Friday evening after 3 p.m. So uh, I just want to remind you on that. Uh, the water treatment plant. There appears to be, in my opinion, uh, two problems, or I should say in council's opinion. The number one problem is at the water treatment plant. And uh, I feel and council feels that the system is not adequately uh, doing its job, but it should be done. Uh, there's the a problem there that the water is not flowing like it should once the pumps is on and uh, there's got to be a valve uh, to be checked uh, to see if that valve probably shuts off or not and this will be done when the contractors comes in uh, the first week in May now what should happen there at, in the plant is 
we should get a flow rate of around 700 gallons a minute. That's good, clean, clear drinking water. And that will give us 42,000 gallons an hour. And with the town shut off, that tank should be filled within 10 hours. Now, if the contractors can do that with good, clean, clear water, then I will say the system is working like it should. Until that's being done, uh, to me and to council, there's a problem, and the system is not working like it should. So we're arranging a meeting with uh, the government officials, David Fay, the contractor, and the engineers as uh, quick as possible to discuss this matter. Now, problem number two, I think we're, we're all aware, I heard Mayor Rand talk about this, I've heard Mayor Reed talk about it from time to time, and that is, what are we going to do uh, wintertime when people are running the water? Now, uh, people are running water, I would say about 50% of the households is, and 50% is not, that's an estimated figure, and we had to control our flow rate down to about, if we can get the flow rate down to about 300, 350 gallons a minute, would be excellent. I mean, uh, the question is, how do we do that? Well, I just want to point out some solutions, and we will certainly follow up with uh, this in the near future. There are things people can do. I know that there are people running their water, people with no heat in the basement, and people with no insulation on pipes, people with uh, the ball taken out of the flush box, box, and if you got a ball taken out of the flush box, that's approximately five gallons per minute that's just running into the ocean. And once that system is up and running, I mean, that's expensive, good treated water. And it, it certainly don't seem right to me to just ignore that type of thing and just dump that good water, costly water, that the people's going to have to pay for it because when we're talking about ozone, we're talking about electricity and it's going to be costly. So there is solutions that can be, take care of some of those problems. And I pointed out there, uh, heated basements, uh, insulated pipes, well-insulated pipes, more soil on the water line outside, even if this is more sods or more mud or more uh, soil of any kind. And there's also a heater coil that can be purchased. Now, I don't know the cost of those things, but I'm going to certainly work uh, and get a cost and, and update you later on that. But uh, I was talking to... Uh, Elster, Elster Hand a while back, and apparently in Alberta that's what they use, and, and the modify one now that's on the market, you don't have to dig up your line and wrap it around, you just push it right out into your water line, plug it into the wall, and it's uh, very little uh, costing energy-wise, and your water never freeze with that. So there's options out there, and we certainly got to explore those options and pass it along to the people, because Right now, we have, uh, before the next uh, winter season, up to the, we have seven months to prepare ourselves for next winter. And uh, let's hope that we can uh, cut our flow rate down, uh, you know, by uh, at least a couple hundred gallons. Uh, if necessary, when it, the work is, being, is done, if necessary, in certain cases, um, and I... Uh, no certain areas where it's probably going to be difficult, but if necessary, there's also a system that can be purchased at a very low price where it's a small tubing that can be connected to your line and you're running out about uh, a liter a minute. Now, the engineers tell us that a liter a minute, your water won't freeze if you're running a liter a minute. So all of that stuff is stuff that got to be looked at over the next little while and prepare ourselves for next winter. Uh, you know, it's possible, but we don't want to, uh, we don't want to get into water meters. I mean, it's the last, it's the last resort we want to go there. Uh, so 
we want the uh, you know, I just ask the people to work with us, us. We just ask for their cooperation in this matter, and and I think we can get this uh, this working. But uh, one thing I want to point out: in the future, in the future, when we issue permits, building permits to build a, a house or a dwelling, and that will be a condition of the permit is that the water main going to that dwelling will have to be uh, down deep enough so. The water won't freeze and the water won't need to be uh, running. So that's something council is going to have to look at. And uh, that's all I ask for is your support in this matter. And I think we can, uh, we can deal with this. And, uh, you know, it's not easy um, to make those type of decisions, but there comes a point in time of we want to move on with the future infrastructure of this community and, and carry on. Then, there's things that we can do, we should do, and I certainly would appreciate it if people uh, be responsible and try and solve some of the, those problems that, that, that I see at around there. And no doubt that council is responsible for some, and I'll tell you that there is areas where from the road to the curb stop, if the, if, if the pipe is not deep enough there, that is a council responsibility, and we will certainly take care of that. But from the curb stop to the house is the individual's private responsibility, and that's all we ask that they, uh, they try and solve that problem. We will keep you updated on what develops uh, out of that meeting we ask with the, uh, with the officials and uh, on the water system. Waste management pilot. Uh, there's a pilot project that uh, both to start and well start as far as I know late April to chuck garbage out of Virgil for a four week period. Now this would be a curbside pickup. Uh, the garbage won't be able to be placed in a garbage container like we do now for those four weeks. It would have to be put right out on the curb, just a, a foot or two from the edge of the hash felt. And the contract or the garbage truck will pick it up uh, there. Uh, and the collection will be once a week, and the people will be notified on BBS Channel 10 on what day the garbage truck is going to be in, in your area so you can get your garbage out. The truck will also be collecting garbage in Ramya and possibly Gray River. Uh, the truck that is going to be used is a uh, used compactor truck from the city of St. John's. It's green in color with St. John's written on the truck and will be driven by Mr. Conrad Dumbert. Once the pilot project is completed and we get a cost that is going to cost per year, we will decide from there if we will continue to truck garbage out of the community. Because once again, if the cost is too high, we're, cert we're certainly not going to be a part of trucking garbage out, unless the government is willing to pay. And uh, we will certainly keep you updated on what happens there. And the contractor, once he starts, he'll be from time to time putting notices on BBS, uh, keep you updated on when the garbage will be collected in your area and what days. We also had written a letter uh, to the government trying to get a representative on the Waste Management Board or committee. And up to this point in time, the government has not made any appointments. So we're still waiting to see if we're going to be uh, successful in getting someone from this community on that board. The National Marine Conservation Area, Councillor John Crant met with Ross first on March night in Cornerbrook, and the discussion of the conservation area occurred, and Councillor Crant tried to encourage uh, Mr. First to keep lobbying the government, try to get them approved the National Marine Conservation Area, so the federal government and Parks Canada can start doing some studies in the area. Because right now, the, the whole up seems to be uh, with the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and, and Mr. Grant uh, encouraged uh, Mr. First to try and uh, break that barrier and get that uh, problem solved. The arena. There's been a lot of activities at the arena this winter, despite the mild temperatures, and I must say that the uh, the Red Commission is pretty active up there all the time, and uh, 
it's good to see uh, there's on weekends and evening time there's something for uh, the kids to do and uh, even adults of course uh, playing hockey and uh, walking and stuff like that so there's always activities at the at the arena during the winter months now my understanding is as of March the 31st the ice surface will be, be removed but there will also be activities during the spring and summer at the arena and I gotta say that uh, the light bill last month at the arena three thousand dollars I mean that's uh, that's certainly uh, not bad it's certainly uh, a good price for artificial ice uh, with the temperatures we've been having and uh, you know the arena is self-sufficient they pay their own light bills uh, and the only thing we pay is the insurance up there so it's uh, it's great to see that the commission has been very active in fundraising and uh, and keeping that uh, building going uh, for the uh, community uh, I must say that the uh, council would like to thank Mr. Stacy Pink, uh, uh, Chair of the Rec Commission and the Commission uh, Commission for their hard work and volunteer service uh, in keeping the arena going. It certainly takes a lot of time. I mean, it's uh, not only weekends, it's nighttime, and we want to take that, thank that uh, committee for that, and certainly hope that they will continue that in the future. It's a uh, one of the volunteer groups in the community that is very active. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, the physically challenged. Uh, council has not yet received a response from the Minister John Burke. Uh, we're still waiting on that, but uh, as you're aware, when you're waiting for a response from the government department uh, on a litter, it certainly takes uh, longer than you really want to take, but uh, within a couple of months, probably you will get a reply. But right now, we don't have a response, so that's all I can comment on that right now. Canada Day celebrations. It is uh, my understanding that the Sand and Sea will not be taking part or organizing, I should say, the Canada Day celebrations this year. Uh, so Council has decided that we will certainly try and get something on the go there, get someone to organize something, some kind of event, because Canada Day is a very important day, and it would be sad to see it uh, go unnoticed, because... Uh, this day is recognized all across Canada, and Virgil always had some little thing on go, and I think we'll carry on with that tradition. The TIOW project uh, that we've been talking about here since January, I guess, uh, the, the applications had to be in by the 19th of February. That was done, met the deadline. On Tuesday of this week, I received a phone call from the uh, government uh, department, and we were successful in, uh, in getting $380,000. Uh, $380,000 was approved for Virgil for the project. It's not what we applied for. Uh, we're, uh, you know, we applied, the total amount we applied for for $617,000. <laughs> Uh, but I'm very pleased to see that 380000 was approved. We had to reduce uh, our plans a little, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's a start, and we'll work, uh, work with that. And uh, we will keep you updated on, in the near future on uh, any future developments, uh, when we're going to start, and how many people is going to be hired, and things of that nature. So I'm very pleased, and it's funded 100% by the government. It cost the town of Virgil nothing. The ICSP, Integrated Community Sustainability Plan, a uh, draft proposal has been approved by council uh, uh, for Virgil, and this has to be sent to the government by March the 31st, and the reason for this is so the community can uh, receive its gas tax. Uh, because there was agreements signed by the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and and in order to get gas tax, uh, the integrated community sustainability plan has to be put in place and approved. And uh, you know, the dra it's a draft proposal, but it's subject to change by council, and uh, that has been done, sent in. In our meeting. 
a fire chief Linehan and Deputy Chief David McDonald attended council meeting and gave a presentation on behalf of the fire department. A request was received from a group called Inch by Inch, Row by Row to erect a sign uh, on council property. This uh, request was approved uh, with conditions attached. And in my last report, uh, I spoke about the Coastal Habitat Stewardship Program uh, where uh, uh, we met with uh, those people at the council office. So we wanted some time to, uh, to just look over the proposal and study it. It's not new, it's, uh, it's been supported by council in the last couple of years. So council did have time to study that report and uh, council approved that report. It was approved, and uh, basically what it is is uh, it's, uh, it's a stewardship program to support and protect uh, oiler ducks, piping plover, and then any waterfowl that's in the area. And the area go from Kings Harbor area to Big Bearsway. Now, uh, you're still allowed to hunt in those areas, and and uh, I guess maintain the bag limit that's on your license. But uh, anybody sees any anything that would be disturbed nesting of the eider duck or the piping plover or, or any oil in the waters near that shoreline or should report it to the proper authorities and uh, they will take care of the problem. But uh, there also has been a tentative date, uh, the minister uh, wildlife, Mrs. Charlene Johnson, uh, will come to Burjo for the official signing of that uh, document. And the tentative date has been set for June 17. Now, this might change depending on her schedule, but uh, that's what we're looking at at this time. So, yeah, we're, we're pleased to be a part of that. We've got to protect uh, our resources for the future, for our kids, uh, for future generations. And uh, that's uh, a good way to start and certainly uh, uh, with the program approved uh, by uh, the community of Virgil, I guess it'll be uh, an edu educational program for our schools as well as the months uh, go by. Uh, in my last report, I mentioned we had to purchase a transmission for the pickup truck. Uh, now, the cost of that transmission, as transmission installed, as uh, uh, $3,049.62, and that was done because it had to be done, and uh, I just want to point out where some of your tax dollars go. And we also had to purchase a computer for the office, and the cost of that computer, tax included, $726, so that's not a bad price. So that's been done and up, uh, working, and proved to be uh, uh, working well. Now. Uh, the fisherman's bait oiling unit down on the wharf there. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the fishermen for volunteering their service uh, in repairs to that building. It's uh, part of keeping the community infrastructure in place. And I know uh, they had very little to work with because I helped them there to follow applications for that grant. Uh, and the maximum grant you could get was $5,000, and most communities received three, but Virgil was fortunate enough to receive five, and uh, and I looked at the building, and I am certainly uh, appreciate what the fisherman has done there, and that $5,000, in my opinion, went a long ways, and, and the reason why it went a long ways is because it's people like the fishermen, like the Welford Dunver and the Max Dunver that and other fishermen that I'm not sure of their names, who volunteered their time down there and put uh, went to work and completely changed, uh, you know, that building. It's certainly a lot different down there now than it was uh, last summer when I was down there. And it's something that had to be done because, uh, I mean, uh, DFA has, comes around, their inspector, and once the building goes so low, I mean, they, they close it. So uh, I certainly appreciate what the fishermen has done, their volunteer work, and hopefully you can uh, get more funding to expand on that. And also the Arbor Authority, Chair June Iscock and uh, her committee, the Arbor Authority, 
I want to commend him for the work they've done down there, keeping the infrastructure in place. And I think, uh, you know, it's, a, it's another volunteer service that we see in our community that's certainly appreciated. And I want to congratulate them on the funds they receive from the federal government because uh, it's certainly good that every dollar that comes in this community is a plus and is uh, certainly appreciated, whether it's uh, a group, organization, or, or the town itself who will receive it. It's certainly appreciated, and we want to commend that committee as well for their volunteer service. The RCMP figure skating over the last two years, and uh, they've certainly done a good job, and I want to congratulate them. Uh, uh, Corporal John Butt, uh, Nicole, and Trish uh, uh, for their service with the figure skating classes. Uh, I think it was excellent, and and uh, the figure skating show that was put off, uh, it was a job well done by Hall. And I guess the most important thing here that I see, it, it, well, it's a volunteer service in the community, but the most important thing I see here is that the RCMP is involved in educating our youth. And I think in the future, uh, as the kids get older, that will point them in the right direction for their future. And I certainly appreciate that. It's good to see that. And I want to congratulate them for that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about pits, uh, cats and dogs, animals in our community. Uh, uh, I guess uh, over the last six months on the radio stations, you've been hearing about abuse and neglect to animals, pits. Uh, in our community, uh, I'm told, uh, I've been contacted a couple of times and I've seen it, a lot of roaming cats. Actually, at Christmas time, uh, there was a cat with two kittens showed up on my door. And I guess being the person uh, I am and my wife is that we decided to feed uh, this uh, cat and her two kittens some of our turkey dinner. And we've been feeding them ever since up to a week ago that I did find a home for one kitten. And it's sad because uh, this winter was, I guess, an ex exceptional winter, but if we'd have had a winter like we had in the past, those kittens would have not survive, and maybe the mother would not survive. So what I did, I built a shelter for those cats and uh, fed them every day. And uh, I got to say that uh, they certainly appreciated it. Now, the mother did leave after the kittens grew up. She left, but she comes back on a, on a bi-weekly basis just to check and see if uh, the kittens is fine. But one of, the kit one of the kittens has been adopted, and I appreciate that uh, person taking that kitten. And uh, I'm still continuing to care for the other one. And I got to say, it's sad. Uh, there's a lot of cats in the community that has no home, but this particular cat looked like to me, the mother cat, had a home, but she was abandoned. She didn't seem to be that wild. Uh, I, I feel that one time somebody, it was somebody's pit, and it was loved by somebody. But somewhere along the line, uh, she was just uh, neglected. Uh, I don't know the people left town or what happened, but uh, it's certainly sad. And if you've got to leave town for work or try and get somebody to look after your pits and that type of thing. And the provincial government is bringing in stricter penalties now for uh, people who abuse, neglect, or cruelty to animals. And the SPCA has certainly been supporting this, uh, those regulations being enforced and penalties enforced. And I just want to make people aware that uh, uh, we got to certainly look at the, something in this community when it comes to pits uh, roaming around because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Curveside pickup on garbage. I mean, if we're going to put garbage on the curveside and there's cats running around like that, I mean, the, the garbage is going to be torn up as well. So there's a lot of factors involved. One is neglect to the animals and abuse, and the other one is it'll cause problems for uh, other people in the community. So please take care of your pits, and uh, hopefully I can find a home for the other kitten. I received a call from MHA Kevin Person, and uh, Mr. Person also contacted Blaine at the town hall uh, this week. In regards to a company called Castellio Resources, uh, they uh, purchased the Oak Brook Gold Mine. 
And this company plans to do some exploratory work in that area this year. And uh, they hope to make the mine profitable again with the price of gold at an at a all-time high. They like to be, and they think they can make the, make the mine profitable. That's their type of work going around uh, buying up uh, old mines, I should say, and reactivating them and getting enough minerals out of them and probably finding new, new spots of minerals and makes it uh, viable. So I uh, gave the manager a call uh, and talked to him, Mr. Uh, Brewer, and uh, they plan to uh, ship their equipment, I guess the heavy equipment, drills, uh, trucks and tractors, that type of thing, from Port of Ass by birds to Oak Brook. But they're interesting, interesting in uh, using Virgil as a supply base for uh, supplying Oak Brook with groceries and I guess small items that got to be transported up there by long liner. So they're interested in Virgil for that. And there's also going to be uh, 12 to 15 jobs there uh, created up at Oak Brook site. So uh, I just want to point that out to you if anybody's interested in pursuing that or if any further information becomes available, we will certainly keep you informed. Now, just the gentleman, Mr. Brewer, uh, the manager of the mine, uh, told me that he was going to contact the president of the company and he was going to have him contact me. So hopefully I'll get a chance to discuss uh, this with him. And any job we can uh, find uh, in Virgil is certainly well be appreciated. Council received a request from the San Jose Committee uh, for donation. Now, Council uh, uh, donates to the San Jose the fireworks every year, and we will continue to do that. Uh, Council received from uh, the many year relay, uh, uh, received a request for donations from them, and we will do the same as we done last year. We supplied them with uh, lapel pins. Because if Council do have a policy, and uh, policy been in place, I guess, for uh, three or four years, maybe longer, uh, where they donate to certain certain groups, uh, and they got, a, they got a strict limit on that. So right now, we're, we're just biding by that policy and uh, and try to do our best uh, where we can. And But there's, because if you don't have a policy in place, I mean, how much donating do you have to do? And uh, it gets to a point where uh, you just wouldn't be able to handle any. Uh, invoices were approved and paid at the last meeting in the amount of $18,225.92. And uh, once again, uh, I would just want to mention on volunteers, uh, April the 18th to the 24th is Volunteer Week. And volunteers connect communities. Uh, that's the slogan I use there. And uh, Council would like to thank all volunteers who served in this community over the past year and over the past years as well. And there's nobody in your community like a volunteer, in my opinion. And I just want to, a little something I think about, uh, there was a famous uh, president in the United States, John F. Kennedy. And I remember the day he was assassinated. I was uh, about nine or ten year old. I was out by the door. Uh, uh, tell you, my budgie bird died that day, and I was out burying my bud budgie bird. And my mother knocked on the window and told me what she heard on the radio. And uh, the words that what that man said sticks in my mind all the time. And I guess everybody is aware of it. It's not what your country can do for you; it's what you can do for your country. And I see there. That's all you got to do is take the word country out and put community in, and that's it. And volunteers, I mean, uh, the reason why volunteers don't get paid is not because they're not worth it. It's because they're priceless. They're priceless. All the volunteer work that goes on in this community and other communities keeps the community active. There's places for people to go and things to do. And without volunteers, that wouldn't be happening. And I, once again, on behalf of Council, want to commend and congratulate all the volunteers in this community. Now, I guess in closing, I just want to, did you know the census, census taken from the District of Fortune Bay in 1845 
which included this area because Virgil fell under Fortune Bay District. There were 29 people living in Kings Arbor and Bayloo combined. And there were 54 people living on Red Island. That's in 1845. A little bit of history to think about. Our next council meeting is scheduled for April the 14th. That's it for this report. Until the next time, good night and may God bless. This concludes our program for tonight. Thank you for watching. Good night. Mm -hmm.